Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another English 10A mini lesson. Today we're going to be talking about plot and its purpose in short stories. So these will be your short story notes for your assignment where you're going to work on taking your Cornell notes again, take them for the short story notes that are presented here, and then you may have to watch it a couple times in order to get all the information, and then you'll submit these at the end. This is a great preparation tool for your quiz at the end of the week, as a lot of information will be on the, the quiz off of these slides. So as we talk about plot, as we get underway here, remember that plot refers to the chain of related events that take place in a story. The individual elements serve as that one link, but just like a chain, they're going to be linked together. If one fails, the chain fails and it breaks its purpose and it doesn't work out. So we need to be very cognizant and aware of what we're doing. So plot refers to the chain of related events that take place in a story. Plot is also a great way as it's to prepare to write because it serves as the writer's blueprint for what happens, when it happens, and to whom it happens. What this means is the writer's blueprint just like an architect, when they, when they plan their blueprint, they have to convey that message cleanly to the person that they hand it to. So you as an author are going to take your blueprint, you're going to flesh it out into a piece, and then you're going to hand it to a reader who is equivalent to a builder. And they have to be able to be able to understand and comprehend what you're trying to accomplish as well. So the plot is a great way to serve as a blueprint, just like knowing where your conclusion is, as Poe taught us in the philosophy of composition. Authors must arrange conflicts, complications, and resolutions to create cause and effect relationships. When we look at the picture on the screen, I'm sure you've seen these before. When you pull that ball up, all the energy goes from one side of the line of balls to the other. Think of this as your plot line. That first ball is the exposition where, that we'll talk about in a minute that enlightens the reader and, and introduces them to everything that's happening in the story. That ball has to cleanly go all the way through to the end in the conclusion. And the conclusion then hits back to the exposition, meaning that these units have to be cohesive. They have to move together in order to make their point. If one is too strong, if your exposition is too strong and you slam it in, I'm sure you've seen this with, with this, this toy and this apparatus before. All the balls get tangled up, and they have a hard time getting untangled. So you need to arrange your conflicts, and authors need to arrange their conflicts and resolutions to create those cause and effect relationships that are evenly and accurately placed from your perspective as well. Readers must not only understand what is happening, but why it is happening as well. And to do that, you have to know why something's happening. You need to ask yourself that question too. Readers must not only understand what is happening, but why it is happening. Meaning that why it is happening depends on your decisions that you make. You need to know your plot and your conflict and your characters well enough to be able to answer that question. And if you can, hopefully that will translate into your writing as well. So if we look at the stages of a plot as a line, if we look at it as a pyramid, you'll see that the stages of plot work. You've probably seen this structure before. It's a, it's a rather traditional diagram to explain a fiction piece in, in a short story. First off, you have your exposition. It's the beginning where you lay the groundwork for the plot and provide the readers with essential background information. That background information could be plot, uh, in terms of plot, it could be characters and setting and the beginnings of a conflict and how that's going to arise. Short stories are anywhere between two pages and ten pages on average, so they can be read in one sitting. So you, need, it, you don't need a ton of exposition like you need in a novel, but you need enough to get the audience to read your point of view and understand that. The rising action. Complications usually arise, causing difficulties for the main characters and making the conflict more difficult to resolve. This is where the action heats up. Your conflict begins to get a little bit harder to understand and harder for the character to deal with. 
Additionally, with that rising action, what happens is as we move forward and we move forward, the characters get a little more depth to them. And the characters in the conflict have more meaning because of that rising action. The turning point of the action is called the climax. This is the utmost peak in your piece. The turning point of the action where the moment, interest, and intensity reach their peak. The climax usually involves an important event, decision, or discovery that affects the final outcome. What this means is this is where everything comes to a head. Your conflict is going to finally meet its, its, its height and your char it, it, this is where the action is going to be the most tense for your piece. Now when we use the word tense, it's, it's in terms of intensity, not tense in terms of the tone. It could be, but it's where your audience is going to feel it the most. The falling action. These are the events after the climax where the resolution begins to come into play, but this is the backlash and, and the outcome and the consequences of what happens at the climax. How is the conflict resolved after that climactic experience? How are the characters reacting? What happens to that point? And that all happens in the falling action. Next, you'll have the denouement, or the resolution. The resolution of the story where, that tang where the tangles of the plot are untied and the mysteries are solved. Now when we say mysteries are solved, we don't mean that it's necessarily a clean ending. We can always have a cliffhanger for our audience as a way to let them think about what's happening. But overall, the tangles of the plot are untied and the mysteries are resolved for our story, for where we're at in the piece. What we set out to do is, is entirely resolved and we have the intended effect on the audience as well. So the denouement or the resolution there. There are pieces that take place inside the story and you can start at different places too in, in a non-traditional approach. This is called in media res. It's a Latin term meaning in the middle of the action, meaning it's just as important an event is about to take place. When does the story begin? There are different types of in media res that you want to consider. First would be a flashback. In, in media res, a flashback is going back in time to describe events that have taken place before the story begins. In a flashback, what happens is we have this event that takes place and it's before the exposition even. But with a flashback, what happens is the audience gets a perspective on the character and how they're going to react based on that experience. It gives reason to their actions in a short story. So it's a great way to do that as well. In Media Res, another way to look at that as well is it starts at right before the climax and then you can work your way back. So you can start there, then hit it again a second time for added emphasis and then conclude as well. So flashback and In Media Res. Foreshadowing is another way to help your reader understand what's going on. Foreshadowing hints at things that might happen later on in the story. These things can be true, they can be untrue, and if they are untrue, it's, it's used in the mystery genre a lot to help the reader understand that there are false trails. You're keeping false trails in there to keep the reader guessing. But foreshadowing is a great way to lead your reader along the way and tell your resolution. And they can either have an aha moment where they go, yeah, I knew that, or they can go, I didn't see that coming. And then look back and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense now. Two ways to look at that. Another way of seeing the structure that's a little less traditional is as follows. If we look at three kinds of punctuation, a question mark, an exclamation point, and a period. At the beginning of the story, it's when you, the audience is going to question things. So in the exposition. Who are these characters? What is the conflict? What's going on? As we get to the top of the rising action and the climax, it's the exclamation point. Again, it's where the action is most intense, most exciting. And finally, just like a period ends a complete sentence, your resolution needs to end completely. It needs to have your, your loose ends resolved in order to be effective. So a question mark, an exclamation point, and a period. 
When you're reading these structures, there's questions that can guide your analysis. These questions are going to be great ways for you to look at different pieces of the story as well. And you'll get a little work with this later on this week as well. So some questions to guide analysis. Is the plot arranged in chronological order, or does it begin in media res? Does it begin in the middle, or does it begin chronologically with first this happened, then this happened, then this happened? And what's the reason behind that? Does the plot involve a flashback, another in media res moment? If so, why is the flashback there? What's its purpose throughout the piece, and why did the author choose to do that? What is the nature of the conflict? What is the problem in the piece? What's the story? And, and why is the problem important? And how does it move that plot along? What conditions at the outset make the situation unstable? What conditions at the outset make the situations unstable? What are those pieces that you've put in that are going to help the reader understand what the conflict is? Is the conflict external or is the conflict internal? What this means is, is the conflict external, so main character versus environment, versus nature, versus person, so person versus person, or is it internal? Is the conflict inside the person in terms of a mental deficiency, um, an emotion that they're feeling, like depression or anger, or is it a situation that they can't handle that's going on internally for them. So is the conflict external or is it internal? Next question, what is the high point or the climax? Where is the turning point in the story? When is it most intense? How is the conflict resolved? Is there no resolution, meaning why? Meaning there are unloose, untied ends and loose ends? And if there is no resolution, why not? Or what in the story is inconclusive? What pieces are inconclusive and why would the author do that and leave it that way? Finally, what patterns do you find in the plot structure? How do you understand and know why those plots are there? What patterns are there to help the reader along? Is there a line of foreshadowing? Is there characters who change throughout? What's the pattern that the author uses to help move you along? Folks, make sure you take your Cornell notes on these, please, and be sure to do well. You might have to watch this video again. And when you're finished, be sure to submit those so you can get the points in this assignment as well. You'll use those guiding, those analysis guiding questions for a piece that you're going to read starting on Wednesday of this week. And as you're, as you're going through, you're going to understand and hopefully use those questions to guide your analysis so you can understand what the author's intended theme is. Have a good rest of the day and contact your instructor if you have any questions. They're here to help.